the state. Uh, we did a survey on each wise centers that are same, but they are for urban population. So there are 14 in the capital city, Raipur. I couldn't find a single run or owned by women. Uh, likewise, in common service center schemes, they are not, I mean, they just, they have declared the list of selected people who would be owning and running the CSEs. Again, we couldn't find a single woman. But uh, there are researches to show, we do have data to show, that because the CSE or each wise centers not only cater to the, I mean, not only include the public service delivery, but they also are centers for providing information to the people, uh, those who visit the centers. And because these centers are owned by the people, I mean, they are being operated by uh, in public-private partnership models, so these centers are also a source of income generation uh, for the uh, people who own them. So, I mean, we have found that women are not owning these centers. Women sometimes feel hesitant in visiting the centers because as I said that these are used for income generating activities so they are used at the cyber cafes also. I just want to know, I mean, that when you talk about the right-based approach, so why the e-governance agenda? Uh, I mean, why don't you think of being, or maybe you must be thinking, I may not be aware of that. I, I just want to know that uh, why the right-based approach in IT policy, in e-governance agenda, it doesn't seem to be that inclusive as the right-based approach are in other sectors in Indian policies or programs. Thank you. Aver, and I'm from the Information Society Project at Yale Law School. And I just wanted to suggest that I think another important part of the rights-based approach is looking at the norms that are already legally binding within the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the covenants, and how can we extend and interpret those to make the argument and support the argument for universal access to the internet. And I would draw particular attention to Article 27 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which speaks about the right of everyone to share in the benefits benefits of scientific and technological progress. Um, and although the Universal Declaration is not binding law, that, that same text finds its, finds its place in Article 15 of the International Covenant on Economic and Social and Cultural Rights. Um, I have, have looked into this. I'm not aware that any national court to date has interpreted this text at all. Um, and I think that that may indicate that civil society has not yet pushed um, for these issues and, and, and for those interpretations. But it does appear that in the next two to five years, um, the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights will be taking up this provision and issuing an interpretation of it. And I hope that all the organizations here who care about universal access will, will take part in that and make sure that the, that the issues of access to the internet um, you know, are given attention within the context of that norm elaboration. Thank you. And for media alternatives in the Philippines, also a member of APC. Um, what uh, Mr. Coven said, I, uh, I've heard that also about uh, right not to to be on the internet, and from progressive people in the Philippines, uh, in basically saying that it's a contested space, but more a, a colonized space already that. Uh, uh, the commercialization and etc cetera, etc cetera. so uh, I think there's a movement to to do more well the more localized movement rather than the global but uh, well it's it's a it's a it's a dis continuing discussion but it's a it's 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 a good uh, thing to to remember that the, the colonized space is still uh, the reality but beyond that I want to make two comments um, one on the um, well, one comment um, is if we are to to ha to uh, promote internet for all, um, I think uh, we have to look at the implications of that call in terms of resources and uh, sustainability, and to uh, twin our call with uh, clear recommendations about how we are going to resolve. Where, where seven billion people will 
will have access devices and where all that will go. So it plugs into the ICTs and sustainability thing we're trying to incubate in APC. So hopefully that could uh, be into that this discussion as well, that uh, if everybody ha will have access, what are the implications on the carrying capacity of, of our planet, et cetera, et cetera. Secondly, it's about representation. Uh, if we are all to have uh, access and a right to it, it becomes clear now what the rep uh, that there will be an issue of representation in the digital space. And I'll, I'll limit myself to a very concrete thing like the domain CCTLD, um, where, the CC where, where if one ha has to have a presence on the internet, one has to get a domain name. Uh, and uh, for many, people are forced to get generic domain names because of the monopoly situations in CCTLD administration, where, uh, yeah, there are artificial scarcities, monopoly behavior of the administrators, and uh, it's commercialized. Uh, I, I remember the PH domain name um, was taken for granted until it was trying to be sold as a phone domain. Uh, and um, it was not clear where, where the income would, ca would go, obviously, to the administrator. So the, these things, there are, there are implications about um, if we are to represent everybody, uh, then there are small things we can do uh, which relate to continuing work on uh, democratization of certain resources that are already there. Thank you. I'd like to respond to the observations made by two delegates here. Uh, one was uh, regarding the multilingualism and local flavor content by our delegate from Pakistan, the academic, and also the academic from India. Here I'd like to look at the internet less as a technological tool, more as a people-related aspect. If I can borrow a line from that famous book, high tech, high touch. So I think the internet requires a high degree of personal contact. And that is where I think the point made by the delegate from Pakistan, I would like to look at it. It's like this. If in the info kiosk or the common service center, which we both in India and Pakistan are familiar with, at that point, interaction point, if the local villager is not fluent in English, that is no problem at all. The data interpreters need to come into play. This is exactly what I mean by high touch. Young, educated people should act as the data interpreters, trying to understand the problem of the locals, and then e do the e-search activity and deliver it back to them in their local content. This is the type of solutions we would like ultimately when the national e-governance plan gets into uh, what I can call full-blown activity. The need is to be actually citizen-centric. I would like to also look at the whole aspect of gender sensitiveness here, that since the village kiosks are not operated by women, so there are less number of women approaching the kiosk owners to seek for solution. It would be appropriate for a lady household member of the owner or the entrepreneur to ensure that there is a participation by the lady members of the house so that it enables more and more women to actually access that point. It's uh, very well taken in our cultural context. Women do not approach a shopkeeper where you do not find that ladies are present and that could be the ways in which we would like organizations like IT for Change, Parminder 
Anita, Gurumurti, all of you, you have been working at the grassroots. I think this is called for the type of social dynamics to be brought about into our context. The solutions are all to be citizen-centric, as the academic from Bilaspur University pointed out. We fully appreciate that. We would like to have more and more feedback from those who are working at the grassroots level in order that the calibrated response from the National E-Government Plan uh, Apex Coordinating Committee could be in tune to the citizens' aspiration. It is a dialogue. It is a two-way process. It should not be driven from the top and much in the nature of the IGF. It should be a multi-stakeholder forum and we should have more and more inputs bottom up. I think we are all for it. I, I hope I have been able to convey some of the responses which you think that uh, government should be citizen-centric and the right to information is very much enshrined. I fully appreciate the point brought out by the academic from Pakistan that more and more content should be brought to the local language, which is exactly what Michael also pointed out. And uh, the National E-Government Plan platform is trying to bring about this multilingualization. Uh, unfortunately, still internet is used more in the English language. And this is one aspect of uh, our approach to bring about multilingualization in the country. Thank you from what uh, Anupam was saying now and uh, if you will convey this uh, to um, uh, the public authorities who are concerned I think one of the concerns is that the commercial interests of the entrepreneur may be in conflict at many times with the citizen interests of the community and uh, this is I think something that's emerging not just uh, from Anupama's research but research uh, all over the country respond to the gentleman uh, up here who uh, addressed the, the, the right to not be um, subject to the internet. I, 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 I in general agree that, um, that the uh, case that I quoted from Canada was a particularly egregious one. It was, uh, it was shocking in a number of ways and, and I must admit to using it in, my, in, in this context. Um, uh, largely because it, it demonstrated and, and, and brought to my attention how, um, how deeply uh, governments in the process of attempting to download and offload various responsibilities and uh, uh, have now begun to use the internet as one of the ways of, of offloading responsibility and uh, challenging governments in that process is uh, it requires a variety of tactics, one of which I think has to do with the, the right to the internet. Uh, your, your point about the aboriginals in, or the indigenous people in the Amazon is quite an interesting one. I, I, I work a lot with indigenous people in Canada and, and some internationally and, and they are amongst the most active and uh, in, uh, most active and intensive users of the internet and I would argue probably amongst the most active, uh, those who are most actively interested in a right to the internet, uh, largely because they see it as a way of equalizing opportunities to themselves, very often because they live in, uh, they're marginalized economically, they also live in remote regions where access to services uh, may only be available electronically. And uh, the um, the process of integrating uh, uh, internet and, and, and electronic forms, in fact, is one that, uh, um, that is, is taking place in very interesting ways. I would say in some ways most effectively in, margin, in, in indigenous communities from, from my experience, simply because they, uh, they do have strong um, local cultures and local uh, indigenous knowledge forms and they're able then to use technology as a supplement to to those act, to, to those forms in ways that that others may not be able to so I uh, just uh, reply in terms of that um, I actually think that framing it is not that complicated we need rights we need 
to live with people having meaningful human rights. And we need to do that through the internet, and we need to have that on the internet. And I think we do have existing rights frameworks that we can work with. I think what's very challenging is, um, or more challenging, is the reinterpretation and also the devil in the detail. So for example, to respond to multilingualism, citizen-centric government needs to make sure that citizens have access to services and information, public interest information, in languages, in their own languages. And the internet can really help to support that, but it cannot be the exclusive medium. But I think where the tricky thing comes from, from the, the, the regulatory point of view is where um, in the development of the technology itself and the way in which the internet is evolving, you have the emergence of closed standards and proprietary standards which can then limit the extent to which we can realize and use the internet as a tool to support, support multilingualism. And in fact, I'd like to ask Sunil Abraham and the audience to perhaps say a little bit more about that. And I think Al Allegra's example about CCDLDs. So there you're talking about a regulatory um, transactional layer, which is not strictly part of human rights, but it impacts on how people can exercise their rights on the internet. But I think for us as rights activists, activists, I think we need to be careful about not lumping all of these things together in, 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 into to one um, set of integrated advocacy. I think they're different areas of advocacy. And I think um, ensuring human rights and ensuring that the internet can be a tool for human rights and is a space in which human rights are respected is one set. And then there are all the more specific national um, 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 specific internet governance arrangements where you need to have rights as a checklist, but you do need to approach it, I think, slightly differently and within the context of specific national ICT policy and regulatory frameworks. But Sunil, could you perhaps say something about rights and multilingualism and standards, or standards more generally on the internet? Could you just introduce yourself, please? Uh, Sunil Abraham from the Center for Internet and Society in Bangalore, India. Uh, I completely agree with what you're saying, Andriette, and I think uh, the question of property regimes and regimes of rent on uh, in intangible property, like software and content and standards, is as important as the questions of property regime and systems of rent on tangible property. So whether we are talking about the content layer or the software layer or even the physical layer of the hardware, uh, having an inappropriate IPR policy framework can really increase uh, the cost of access and also change the dynamics for control and ownership and access. So uh, just to give you a simple example, if you were to look at a regular technology very common in India and China, which is DVD players, uh, there are about 3,000 patents associated with the DVD player technology, and these patents result in increasing the cost of a DVD player by anywhere but from $5 to $20. So this is a very serious problem and affects almost all of us. Yeah, I just very feel like to address the question that gentleman asked about the uh, one of the fundamental principles that I talked about, uh, respect for cultural diversity and uh, multilingualism. Um, why are we talking about the governance of the internet? It's not just for the sake of, you know, the legal issues. It's a, essentially internet is a communication tool and that communication is part of human needs. Communication is one of the fundamental human needs. And we all know that we speak, we have different mother tongues, we speak different languages. It is, I think, our right to receive information in the language that we are most familiar with. There is, a, there is a body of knowledge that is available today that says that the performance of children who receive education in the mother tongue up to a certain age is much better compared to those who are given education in uh, other languages. So to, to, to be able to receive information in the, the language that you're 
that, that is your language. It is part of your also, your culture is part of your identity. Your language is part of your identity. And you, you shouldn't be given and ignored the right to not to receive information in the language. Second point that I want to address is um, the question of who will enable the uh, internet for all. Internet for all, like education for all, or information for all, God knows everything is for all. No, the all is a person. It's not a collect, you know, a, a collective uh, uh, being. That is, that's why it is important to address the issue of uh, the culture and the language, and also the mother tongue. And the, the whether or governments alone can provide internet for all, the private sector can provide internet for all, we, we realize that it is no single entity is going to do that. And that's why the WSIS adopted the multi-stakeholder approach, and I think this multi-stakeholder approach is here to stay. In an organization like UNESCO, we've realized, you know, we were close to doing business with the private sector. We realized that in this business, you can't simply say no to private sector involvement, as you cannot say no to the engagement of civil society if you are in the business of communication information. So it is, you know, if we want to uh, penetrate uh, deeper and make these tools more powerful and useful and, uh, and productive for, for the people as a whole, then I think you have to rely on a multi-stakeholder approach involve all s sections of the society. And I think this discussion on right-based approach to internet governance is clearly a reflection of that, uh, that, that, that realization. Thank you. It's been made. I think one of the things out of this panel is the fact that there's a very strong consciousness of the fact that it, this is not an imposition. Internet for all is not implied as an imposition. It's not to turn all of us into virtual citizens or to assume that everything can be done through and on the internet. But I think it's clear that it's a vital part of that whole process of ensuring services, accountability, and I think that's where it comes in, but it needs to be linked to real-time processes. I think what's made the right to information movement so powerful in India is the fact that a lot of information is made available by right um, and responsibility on the internet, and that it's, but its translation into real-time processes is the, involves civil society, and you couldn't do without both. So there's the question of the duties and responsibilities in great detail of the duty bearers, but there's also the, actually the strong civil society movement which was both responsible for, for starting that and for realizing it on a day-to-day -day basis. So somehow we have to see both of these together. Secondly, I think this idea of the internet as just being the web is something that we also need to, to sort of question. Because there's nothing that to say that if you put something on the web that it can't be made available through streaming radio or through other kinds of IT tools which push it back, not just sort of assume that everyone will go and get the information. And I think that's the kind of violation that uh, Michael was talking about, the assumption that it, because something is efficient, it's feasible and accessible, it doesn't follow. But I think it is a critical thing that we need to realize. And I think we have this very strong, ambiguous relationship with IT, whether you're an indigenous person or you, you know, you're someone sitting in this room. I mean, many indigenous languages would not have survived had it not been for the involvement of diaspora communities and others who were able to link and keep those cultures alive. It is not a substitute, but it's a critical part of that whole involvement. So I think that's one of the things to... And the last point, I think, which, which is coming up over and over again, is just the fact that the realization of these kinds of rights-based frameworks really involves a very diverse constituency and a way of trying to, to talk to each other along that, those lines. The people who are the lawyers, the practitioners, the people who are focused on services. I mean, in Europe and the States, it might come as a big surprise that a lot of this is taking place through a discussion of services. Um, or the kind of right to information movement in India. It, it doesn't necessarily resonate where the, the, the whole question of rights, of privacy and all are very different. And I think there needs to be that kind of learning as well along North and South lines. For example, I don't think we think enough about privacy issues when we're concerned with efficiency and service delivery. And that's something that comes up or hasn't come up enough, I think, in our context. So I think there is a need for this kind of constant engagement with diversity rather than assuming that 
a rights-based approach involves just pushing the internet or involving just sort of the responsibilities of duty bearers. Thank you. Um, I, I want to touch on the question of universal, um, universal access and uh, especially universal affordable access. Um, going back to some of the views raised at the East African IGF, um, which happened about a month ago. Um, specifically with regards to access to infrastructure, as, um, an example was given of uh, Uganda's implementation of a universal access fund. Um, which is in Uganda called the Rural Communications Development Fund, or RCDF. So it's been set up very well. Um, it specifically invites operators and interested parties to apply for making grants or matching, matching grants to support uh, development of infrastructure in underserved areas, um, which have largely been overlooked by the incumbent, the telcos, etc due to the low levels of disposable income in those areas. So of course most of these areas are the rural areas um, and some maybe the sort of low income areas in the urban, um, uh, urban environments. That's great, it's excellent. This is an opportunity to actually get some access, isn't it? No, because the criteria that has been set out by the regulator for applicants is so stringent that only the large telcos can be able to qualify. So what happens is the sort of smaller entrepreneurs and things like that who actually have an interest and see a niche opportunity are restricted. Two days ago, um, I heard that in India you have a very similar situation where voice of IP regulation has been put in place, which is very broad and very liberal and very permissive. However, the criteria that has been set out in the regulations prohibits the smaller players the actual entrepreneurs who go out there and make the difference from actually being able to implement it. And the large operators, they're not interested because this is just a waste of um, you know, effort in, in a manner of speaking. So I think um, what, uh, what, I'm, what I'm leading to uh, with regards to the issue of rights is access is fundamental, it's crucial. However, a lot of the measures that are being taken to increase and improve access are somehow not being implemented right. I think it, it's a call upon civil society to ensure that through consultation, a lot of these loopholes or roadblocks can be identified and dealt with before the actual implementation. Or if they are already in place, advocacy activities to change them are necessary. Thank you. Thank you much. We're at the end of an extremely rich discussion. Um, I just want to make one point um, that you know, we've heard from Radhika that, you know, in your everyday life, to function effectively, you seem to need the internet. And it's not just about people in this room, but actually the fact that the, the t totality of being a citizen is linked to the internet actually speaks to the potential of the internet to democratize information communication and, and um, a citizenship. And in some sense, I think um, uh, while, you know, Many of us in the room have actually spoken to what Al uh, referred to as a colonized space and what some others refer to as a diverse constituency and the need for actual engagement across stakeholders. I think one thing we must remember in, in the context of uh, an internet for all is that for many, many disenfranchised people, um, like uh, the people we work with, Adi for Change works with in the villages, the internet actually represents a never before opportunity to, for them to actually become part of mainstream. And to that extent, how these diverse constituencies actually uh, dialogue and what actually is achieved out of that dialogue uh, and whether it's actually, um, you know, whether, whether the odds uh, are against or for the, these disenfranchised groups is a very important question. And I think that question links to the question of governance. And um, that is where I think uh, not just how, what Andrea referred to as, you know, we have human rights and the internet is necessary for accessing human rights, but also what is that right to access the internet uh, becomes a critical question. Thank you.